for you to take your Bible this morning and turn to the book of 1 Samuel. The book of 1 Samuel. If you're having trouble finding that, you'll find it just ahead of 2 Samuel, okay? So 1 Samuel and chapter 1. And I want to talk to you this morning for a few minutes on the subject, trouble. Everybody is in trouble. If you don't think you're in trouble, go home and watch the news today. You're in trouble. You're either just coming out of a very troubled situation, or else you are presently in it, or else you just emerged from it, and you're getting ready to go into more trouble. So let's see what the Bible says about how to handle trouble and what it actually is. And so in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, we read these words. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. Trouble. <laughs> the name of the one was Penina, and, Pen and the other was Hannah. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Trouble. And the man went up from the city yearly to worship and sacrifice the Lord of hosts in what we call Shiloh. Actually, in the Hebrew tongue, it is Shiloh. Went up to Shiloh, and also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were the priests of the Lord who were there. Now, you don't know it, but that is more trouble. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all of her sons and daughters, but to Hannah, he would give a double portion because he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, Penina, also provoked her severely for no other reason than to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it was year by year that when she went to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, and therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart so grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? And Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. And Eli the priest was sitting at the seat by the door, sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened that as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth, and Hannah spoke in her heart, but her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. And Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a man of, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. And I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your servant to be a, this translation says, a wicked woman, literally a woman of Baliel. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. And Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And so the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. This was in the days of the judges, and in those days there was no temple, a place to worship. And so coming out of the wilderness, the children of Israel had set up the tabernacle of the wilderness in this place called Shiloh. 
And those who wanted to go to that place to worship would come from all over Israel. Elkanah was no exception, and he came every year bringing his entire family once a year to the tabernacle there to worship. But it was not a happy experience. In fact, if you just want to know the truth about it, there was never a happy day at Elkanah's house. He worshiped God. He looked to God for fulfillment. But in fact, life was miserable at his house. Now, this begins, of course, in the marriage of the second wife. No man needs more than one. No man can handle more than one. Or should I say, more than one wife, that makes a powerful mountain for any man to climb. And if you learn to understand the one wife God has given you and to express your love to her appropriately, you will have achieved more than the vast majority of humans on this globe ever accomplish. So there was trouble every day. Now I want you to consider Hannah for just a moment with me this morning. I want you to consider that Hannah had three things in her life that she could do nothing about. First of all, she had an adversary that she could not placate. She lived every day with Panina. She couldn't send her off to California. There was no way to get Panina out of the picture. She had to live with her every day. Now, it is certainly the case that she could have put a spider in her coffee. But if she had killed her, then she is a murderer. She will not enjoy the love and appreciation of her husband and her whole family anymore. The whole thing is wrong. There is not one thing Hannah can do about an adversary in her life that she cannot overcome. I wonder how many of you today have an adversary in your life. I know it doesn't make sense. Everybody ought to appreciate you. They ought to all automatically love you. And it makes no sense in the world. Why in the world? These folks simply don't care for you. You're a good guy. You're a wonderful lady. And the world should automatically receive you. But for some reason, somebody just can't stand you. Now, in some cases, you are married to him. In some cases, it is a child of your own loins. In some cases, it is somebody that works with you. In some cases, it's someone that goes to school with you. And it doesn't make a, sen a bit of sense in the world, but the fact of the matter is that you are faced every day that you live with an adversary that you cannot placate. You can do everything in the world to make them happier, and they still won't be happy. Now, for some of us, that's sort of life in uh, as usual. Uh, some years ago, I was traveling through Houston, Texas, and it was during the time when I was under quite a bit of fire. Matter of fact, most days I was able to enter my office without opening the door. I just slid through the crack underneath. I was so low. And uh, I was walking through the airport in Houston, and I looked down, and there's the Wall Street Journal. And that's not unusual. What was unusual is my picture was on the front of it. And that was before they started running pictures in the Wall Street Journal. And so it was just an ink drawing. And I thought, you know, this is probably not good. So I bought a copy. And sure enough, my friend Gus Niebuhr had uh, written an article that he knew better then. I talked to him about it later. I said, Gus, what in the world were you thinking when you said all those things? He said, Paige, I work for an editor. I do what I'm told. Well, so much for freedom of the press. But in any event, he had done what, what he said, that what they told him to do. And so I sat in my desk and I read this article. And my goodness, if one half of what he said about me was true, it is a thousand wonders. My mom and dad didn't throw me on the trash heap when I was born. I mean, it was absolutely terrible. I certainly hope it wasn't true. But I sat there and I was just so dejected. I didn't know what else to do. And so I know better than to do this, but I just let my Bible fall open. And I said, dear God, speak to me from it. And, and guess what it said? It said, love your enemy. 
Well, that's just what I was sitting there thinking. <laughs> Dear God, please up an 18-wheeler to come along and run over him, you know. And, I'm, and, and particularly, he had quoted Dr. Ken Chafin several times, and, and uh, Ken was uh, one of my fellow Southern Baptist preachers who didn't like me, and he said a lot about me all the time, and, and, and oh, it was bad. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, I better keep reading. And so I did, and it said, pray for those that despitefully use you. I better keep reading. And so I did, and it said, return good for evil. Now I ask you, is that not irritating? It asks you to do three things. Return good for evil, love your enemies, pray for those that despitefully use you. I mean, how are you going to get along in life doing that kind of thing? Well, I, I claim to believe the Bible is 100% true and that we ought to obey it. It's sufficient. And so I didn't feel like it, but I felt like I ought to try to fulfill that. I couldn't figure out how to do that. So I had an apartment store across the street, department store across the street, and I walked across there, found me a beautiful tie, and I bought that thing, and I put a little note with it and said, Dear Ken, I was just thinking about you today, and as I thought about you, I prayed for God's blessings upon you. And then I did that to be sure I was telling the truth. And then I wrapped that tie up, and I sent it to Ken Chafin. Well, Ken went on to be with the Lord not too long ago. Shortly before he died, somebody said, that's a pretty tie you got on Ken. He said, yeah, it's one of them Paige Patterson gave me. And they said, one of them? He said, yeah, as far as I know, this is number 28. Well, that's exactly true. I didn't keep up with the exact number, but I knew it had to be somewhere in that area. And I started a habit in my life of returning good for evil. Now, why did you do that, Brother Page? To heap coals of fire on their head? No, I have nothing to do with that. That's between them and God. I did it because I needed to break an evil spirit in my own heart. I needed to get at the core problem, which was the way I was responding to people that I felt did not respond to me correctly. And I want to tell you what, it's been one of the greatest blessings of my life to return good for evil. You almost get to the point where you almost want evil to happen to you so you can go buy a tie. I mean, it's amazing. And, and so let me just tell you that that's going to happen to you. There are people in your life who will be implacable adversaries. But not only that, in addition to that, she had a circumstance she could not overcome. She was childless. And we can hardly identify with that today. We think it's a great blessing from God if we don't have children. And in fact, we'll go so far as to abort that little one in the womb and the safety of the womb of its mother We'll take that life rather than have a child, and we'll think nothing of it, whatever at all. What a difference it is in a social order then and now. Then, to have a child was an evidence of God's blessing in your life. To fail to have a child was an evidence of God's judgment upon you in some way. Now, Hannah went to the marketplace, and I want to assure you, everybody was very kind to her in public. Hi, Miss Hannah. How are you doing today? But then she heard when she walked on by as they whispered aloud, wonder what Hannah did when she was a teenage girl, that she's childless. God has judged her. And sure enough, we find out that it was God who closed her womb. Oh, my goodness. She had a circumstance that she could not change. How many of you are sitting here today with a circumstance you can't change? Some of you listening to me today have cancer, and you're fighting it every way you know how, but it may or may not look all that hopeful in the long run. Some of you are sitting here with other chronic diseases that plague your body, and, and it's only a matter of time till all of us go down that way. And some of you are sitting here with circumstances in your business that you can't turn around. It seems to be going south, and there seems to be nothing you can do about it. Many of you have circumstances that you cannot alter in your life. What do you do when you have an enemy you can't placate and a circumstance you can't change? Well, what happens is you end up with a hurt 
you can't heal. It hurts so bad. It hurts so deeply. You cannot heal it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say to you today that you only have two alternatives. You can work at fixing all of this. All you want to, you will fail. One thing we know about human fixes is they don't work. Ever since Adam and Eve tried the fig leaves in the garden, it doesn't work. Did you ever feel the texture of a fig leaf? This was bound to fail from the very outset. And so ever since then, all human solutions eventually fail. So let me assure you that in all these circumstances in life that you face, you have two and only two possibilities. Number one, you can brood on it, think about it, live with it, grapple with it, gradually get bitter about it, and by the time you're as old as I am, and most some of you will make that age, as you get this age, nobody will really like being around you because you're a bitter old woman or a bitter old man. Now that's one choice that you have. What is your alternative choice? Your alternative choice is to do what Hannah did and take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Now I want you to see what happened to her. When it's a rainy day, folks, it gets worse and worse, I assure you. So she goes to the temple or to the tabernacle and uh, she is not eating and her face is distraught. And uh, uh, so Elkanah comes to her, uh, enter Elkanah. He is going to resolve the problem. He's going to teach her a little logic. You know you ladies have no logic. And uh, so says your husband anyway. And so he's going to teach her a little logic. And so he says, Hannah, why are you so defeated and cast down? Why, why will you not eat? Don't you know that I am better to you than ten sons? Come on, Elkanah, get with it. You not understand anything about women? No, he doesn't, neither do you. Just when you think you've got it down, you don't. What you think is romantic today is because it was romantic yesterday, but it changed overnight. And I warn you, it won't work a second time. So this whole thing is added up against you guys. And it, the last thing you want to do is try to teach your wife some logic because she's been thinking way ahead of you anyway. And she feels much more deeply about these things. You do. Elkanah, what on earth are you doing? She bursts into tears and she runs for the tabernacle. And there she begins to pray. Now she is praying so fervently, tears streaming down her cheeks and her lips are moving, but there's no sound coming out of it. And can you believe this? Now the preacher doesn't understand. And Eli says, Woman, how long are you going to keep on drinking that booze you're drinking? Oh, my goodness, is this not insult to injury? I mean, when even the, priest, uh, the preacher doesn't understand you, and he, he calls it wrong, and he accuses you of something that you're not guilty of. But look, folks, when it starts going wrong, it all goes wrong, okay? You just need to get ready for that. That's part of life. She doesn't let it bother her a bit. She pours out her soul to God. Look at what she says here. She said, in bitterness of her soul, then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will look on my affliction and if you will remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give me a male child, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Lord. I'm going to give him back to the Lord all the days of his life and he'll have the holiest of all the vows in Israel. He'll have a Nazarite vow. And to show that, no razor will ever come on his head. And when Eli says, you're drunk, she says, oh, no. Don't count me to be a woman of Baliel. That is a woman of the devil. Literally, it means the worthless one. But it came to mean the devil, a woman of Baliel. For I am a woman of sorrowful heart. 
and I have poured out my soul unto God. Now Eli realized his mistake. And Eli spoke to God and then to her and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And the woman went her way, and her face was no longer sad. She made a vow to God. When the answer came from God, she trusted God with the answer. And she went out, and her face was no longer sad. Now, what's the end of the story? Well, thank you for asking. And let's see what happens. So then they rose early in the morning, worshiped before the Lord, returned and came to his house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And folks, that doesn't mean he got acquainted with her. Okay? Wasn't a matter of, hi, Hannah. I'm Elkanah. This is the very personal new that means that he had intimate relations with her, and the proof of that is in the very next phrase, and the Lord remembered her, and sure enough, it came to pass that in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name, we say it Samuel, actually Samuel in the Hebrew tongue, saying, because I have asked him from the Lord. Now, I just want you to note the way the Bible expresses that. Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah. Did you know that in the knowing of a woman, in that intimate expression, that is all a part of the design of God? And that is actually a holy moment before God? Now, not the way it comes out in most of culture, where it ends up being nothing but selfish and lustful. But the way God designed that intimacy was for one man to know one woman in such a way that neither one of them ever know another human being on the face of this globe. And that knowledge that they have of one another in that way is a holy knowledge that is the closest approximation to what it means to know God. To know God intimately is to know Him as only you can know Him. Nobody else knows Him exactly as you know Him. And so that is a holy, a moment of worship when you are intimately involved with your wife. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to sing just as I am through the whole thing or anything like that, but it does mean that it is a holy moment when God has approved what is happening and you are acting out that intimacy, which is a still greater intimacy with God. Elkanah knew his wife and she conceived. Oh, dear. What a marvelous thing. Her problem is partly solved. She conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel. Well, the man Elkanah and all of his house went up to offer to the Lord yearly sacrifice in the, in, in, uh, and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, not until the child is weaned and I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. And so they went up. And then in verse 26, finally, he is weaned. Now, normally, a Hebrew woman did not wean her child at this time until he was four to five years of age. And so he is nearly five years of age, maybe five. And so what happens? She comes, and she brings her son Samuel with her. And then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have sent him to the Lord. So long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. And so they worship the Lord there. And Hannah and Elkanah returned home. And Samuel 
stayed with Eli. And is God good? Now she would rather have taken him home. But Hannah had a promise to God. She had promised him, Lord, if you'll open my womb, if you'll take away my reproach, if you'll give me a male child, he is yours forever. And she could not go back on her promise to God. How many times have you made God a promise? If God, you will only do this, I will, and then you don't. Hannah was true to her promise. And you know what? God was not through with his blessings. Because not only did that little boy grow up in the very presence of God there with Eli, but that little boy becomes the first and the greatest of all the prophets. His name is known everywhere. And we read first and second Samuel, the story of Samuel again and again and again and again because God had it in his mind to answer the sweet prayer of Hannah when she appeared before him. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to submit to you today that you have only two choices. You can keep it bottled up in your soul. You can nurse the grudge. You can relive the sorrow day after day after day. You can agonize over it, and you will gradually become bitter over it. And in your bitterness, it will ruin your life, and it will ruin the life of everybody around you that you love, and it will ruin the life of your church. And that's what happens when you become bitter. Or you can do like Hannah. Oh, Lord God, would you hear my prayer? I bring it to you today. I leave it with you. I take my burden to the Lord and leave it there. And when you do that, I want to promise you something. God will powerfully answer that prayer. It may not be exactly what you wanted, but it will be better than what you wanted. God always does better. When I was a 16-year-old young preacher, I preached one night at First Baptist Church Groves, Texas, in a week-long revival, and I was preaching there on Sunday night, first Sunday night. Frank Gare, the pastor, he um, said to me after the service, Brother Page, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, I'll come by the hotel, get you, and we're going to go make a pastoral call. Now, that was irritating to me. I was a 16-year-old preacher, and all the sweet little old ladies in the church came by and patted my red head, said without a doubt I was the next Billy Graham, and I believed that. Shouldn't have, but I had. And um, I was feeling pretty good about myself, and I'm an evangelist. What does he mean, go make a pastoral call? That's his responsibility. But I do believe every word of the Bible, and I'm under pastoral authority when I go someplace, so as young as your pastor is, if he told me to do something, I'd have to do it. While I'm here, I belong to him. And so uh, I said, okay, Brother Frank. So Brother Frank came by and picked me up the next morning at 10. He said, we're going to see Dorothy Faye Mendenhall, and she'll pray for you. Now, I didn't like any of that. Dorothy Faye Mendenhall probably wasn't a man. All likelihood with the name Dorothy, it was a woman. And what do he mean? She'll pray for you. Man, I'm the preacher. I pray for other people. Give me a break here. What in the world's going on? We pulled up for a little frame house and, and uh, obviously needed painting. It wasn't a very nice part of town either. And he said, come on, we'll go in. And so Brother Frank walked up the door and knocked on the door, said, uh, Dorothy Faye. But Frank here, coming in, and he opened the door and walked in. Now, my daddy taught me not to do that. He said, you walk in without an invitation, you're probably coming back out real quick. Shotgun blast following after you. And, and I, I couldn't believe Brother Frank walked in, but I, I, at least he was first, and I was second, so I followed him on in. And, and not only that, not only did he walk in, but you know what he did when he got in? He turned right and walked right into that woman's bedroom. And there ain't no way I'm ever going to do that. I was a little slow getting in there, but I finally looked around the door and saw Dorothy Faye Mendenhall. 
She was about 28 at the time. I'll never forget her as long as I live. She was a paraplegic and almost quadriplegic. She had a little use of her arms, not much. She was a victim of a inebriated physician who delivered her and so horribly injured her spine that she lay flat on her bed for all 68 years of her life. She never left the bed. I took one look at that woman, and I remembered what Frank had said. She will pray for you. I thought, if there was ever anybody that needed prayer, this is that person. And I tried to understand what she said, but her boy, her, her, her expression was uh, also affected and had to listen very carefully to finally get the cadence of her speech and finally began to understand her a little bit. And we visited about 15 minutes, and but Frank said, well, okay, Dorothy Kay, Dorothy Faye, we're running along, and I just want you to meet our evangelist this week. And I told him you'd pray for him, and so before we leave, if you wouldn't mind, would you pray for him? And I'm still thinking, well, Frank, we need to pray for her. What do you mean, pray for him? And then she began to pray. I never heard anything like it in my life. It was as if she took those little old gnarled hands and reached up to heaven, grabbed hold of the veil between heaven and earth and pulled it wide. The glory of heaven shone into that room. It was so real, I was sure God was there. I'll admit to you, I risked one eye. I opened it to see if I could see him. It was so real the presence of God I've never seen anything like it in my life and I suddenly found myself doing something no self-respecting 16 year old boy right off the gridiron ever likes to be doing in public I found myself with tears welled up in my eyes running down my face and falling on the ground and I could not understand it but that woman prayed me into the presence of God when she finished I blurted out, I said, Dorothy Faye, will you pray for me every day? And she said, no. <laughs> and I said, why? And she said, Brother Frank, show him my calendar. He picked up a calendar off the bedside table and he showed it to me. Every day, for 18 hours a day, every 30 minutes, somebody's name or some object of prayer was written in there. That's what she did all day long was pray. When I came to October 19th, my birthday, I looked, and I said, Dorothy Faye, if I found an empty slot and I put my name in it, would you pray for me one day a week? She said, there's an empty place? I said, yes, ma'am, on my birthday, there's an empty slot. She said, well, Brother Paige, you put your name in there, and I'll pray for you on that day. And so I did. I wrote it in there so she could have read it from Michigan. I mean, I wrote it big. And... Uh, and sure enough, every year for a long time, I'd receive a note from Dorothy Faye Mendenhall on October the 19th assuring me that she would be praying for me on that day. We walked out the front door, and I said, Brother Frank, there is something I don't understand about this. What in the earth is going on? He said, well, Brother Page, he said, you know, we baptize about 300 people a year. I said, I know it's the most phenomenal thing that anybody ever saw. This was in a day before churches did that. I said, how on earth does that come about? He said, at least half of them, 150 a year, are directly traceable to Dorothy Faye Mendenhall. I said, how? And he says, well, people go by and give them the name. And, and he said, if they ever give her the name and she starts praying for them, they may as well just get on down to the church and get in line at the baptistry because they're going in. There's going to be no question about it. She'll pray them right in. But he said, that's not all that happens. She said, he said, people drop by the house and knock on the door. And she says, come in. And they come in and they say, maybe a delivery man or something like that. They say, Ma'am, I'm sorry to bother you. Don't mean to, to upset you. I don't know why. Do you need something? I just felt that I had to stop at this house and come in, and, and I don't know why I did it. Could you tell me? And she said, yes, sit down, and I'll tell you. And she'll lead them to faith in Jesus Christ right there. Now, listen, I finally asked Dorothy Faye one day, 
Don't you wish you were whole? Don't you wish you could run, jump, enter the Olympics? Don't you wish that you could just walk around like other girls? Don't you wish you could have a home? Oh, she said, Brother Bates. She said, I used to wish that all the time. But she said, you know what happened was that I finally realized that I had a better situation. That God had been gracious and answered my prayer. And he had given me opportunities I would never have had to speak to hundreds of people that would not have listened any other way. And she said, Brother Page, in all likelihood, before you get there, I'll be in heaven. And she said, I'll run, and I'll jump, and I'll be fine for all eternity. And she said, then I'll be rejoicing over every minute of my life. Would you bow with me, please?